Thank you everyone for joining and welcome to our call on transforming healthcare payment and delivery. I'm Ariel Kane, the Director of Healthcare at PPI, and please feel free to send me questions during the call. My email address is akane at ppionline.org. On the call today, I have former Governor John Kitzhopper. He's a former emergency room physician, state legislator, and three-term uh, governor of Oregon. He's the author of the Oregon Health Plan, which built a defined benefit based on a prioritized list of healthcare services, and the chief architect of Oregon's coordinated care organizations, which now provide care to a million Oregonians with a global budget indexed to a sustainable growth rate. I also have former Governor Jack Markell. He served as the 73rd governor of Delaware from 2009 to 2017, overseeing the state during the Great Recession and its aftermath. Markell was also the chair of the National Governors Association and the Democratic Governors Association. Prior to that, he served for 10 years as state treasurer. And finally, I have Jerry Anderson, who is a professor of health policy and management, international health and medicine, and the director of Johns Hopkins Center for Hospital Finance and Management. Prior to joining Hopkins, Dr. Anderson worked in the office of the secretary at HHS. His research focuses on drug pricing, chronic conditions, comparative insurance systems, medical education, healthcare payment reform, and technology diffusion. Thank you all for being here today. In the midst of a public health crisis, hospitals and healthcare providers need a bailout. 1.4 million healthcare jobs were lost in April in the midst of this pandemic. A new report from the American Hospital Association estimates that hospitals and health systems in the US could have incurred more than 200 billion in losses this in this year due to the changes brought on by COVID-19. What does that say about our overall healthcare system? Governor Kitzhaber? Oh, you're still on mute. I, let me see if I can unmute you. I cannot. How's that? Perfect. Down there, great, thanks. <laughs> uh, well, I think it says a number of things. One, uh, the areas of the system that are, have been hit the hardest are the ones that are very dependent on fee-for-service which exposes the flaw in a business model that is uh, dependent on volume, regardless of the value of the services that are being delivered. And I think the transformational opportunity here is to make sure that the dollars that we use to bail out or support the system are linked in a meaningful way to a transition from fee-for-service to risk-based contracts, where the providers are, uh, assume responsibility for the total cost of care. I think even more significant, however, is that <clears throat> I think the move from fee-for-service to capitated models is going to become a necessity, if not an economic uh, requirement, uh, as opposed to a goal, as the COVID uh, pandemic exposes the dependence of the US healthcare system on public dollars and the extent to which those dollars are underwritten by public debt. I consider, for example, that the healthcare system is the only economic sector that produces goods and services that none of its customers can afford. And the only way that works is because the care for individuals is heavily subsidized uh, with public dollars, either directly through Medicare and Medicaid uh, or indirectly through the, the uh, tax exclusion for employer-sponsored coverage. So 90% of Americans now depend on public subsidies for their health care, and those public subsidies are growing faster than the general economy, which means that health care is a major driver of the national debt. The implications of that are that the economic viability of our health care system increasingly depends on the ability to borrow the money that sustains it and on the capacity of the US government to continue to absorb more debt. So if the, <clears throat> if the government is constrained in its borrowing capacity, the financial underpinnings of the system begin to unravel. And that's exactly what's happened with COVID-19. At the end of December, we had a national debt of $23 trillion and a GDP of about 21.4. In the first quarter, the economy shrank by about 5% and our national debt has gone up to $25 trillion. That'll have to get bigger. We know the economy is going to shrink further. That leaves no capacity whatsoever to absorb a projected 60% increase in the size of the healthcare sector uh, bet between now and, and, uh, and 2028. Uh, so we've really crossed a Rubicon in my, in my view. We're entering an area of enormously constrained public resources and there's no going back. The fact is that neither private sector employers or the government can afford this system anymore, particularly at its current rate of inflation given the tremendous economic losses that have been suffered by individuals and businesses and the amount of public debt that's been accumulated just to keep the wheels on the economic wagon. So I think it's imperative that we reframe the healthcare debate, which for decades has been polarized by the fact that neither Democrats or Republicans assume any fundamental change in the underlying healthcare business model or cost structure. We either 
pay for it or we don't, which creates this false choice between cost and access and does nothing to reduce the cost of the subsidies being delivered. But with this tremendous downward pressure on the healthcare system, which I think is the new norm for the foreseeable future, we have a once in a generation opportunity to shift the focus of the debate from coverage to value and reducing the total cost of care through models that seek to expand coverage uh, and reduce the rate of medical inflation while maintaining quality uh, and outcomes. And those models are out there in Oregon, in Maryland, in rural Pennsylvania. And I think a challenge is to identify them, make them greater than the sum of their parts, and then figure out how to, uh, to scale those nationally. Great, thank you for that. And I think, you know, as you're saying, it's it's never been clearer um, that we need to reform healthcare delivery, but we've been discussing healthcare reform for the better part of half a century. Why is it so hard to make progress on this issue? Governor Markell? Uh, well, first of all, I agree with everything that Governor Kitzhaber said, and I thought he put it really well and concisely. And I mean, let's face it, I mean, COVID is forcing us to confront uh, the very much broken structure uh, of our system. You know, the, the ACA made a lot of progress in terms of increasing access. And in fact, it's, it's incredible that now uh, the, G, the, uh, the Republicans you know, are continuing to try to repeal it without any plans to replace it, not uh, opening up uh, the, the enrollment periods again, even in the midst of this crisis. And things are just so much worse uh, than they were. And I think it's really forcing us all to confront what we're left with, with, you know, 30 million, 30 million people out of work. We don't know how many of them, and, and a lot of them uh, getting their health care coverage through their employer. We don't know how many of them are going to be able to get that back. And so it's one thing to have a system built on employer-based care when so many people are working. But now with so much uncertainty, uh, about the recovery and a lot of uncertainty about how many people are going to go back on their employer-based care, we are facing really an unbelievable crisis. And that means people going to Medicaid, to the exchanges, uh, maybe not to be insured at all. And for any of those three, I mean, taxpayers are going to be picking up massive new spending to, to cover people. And so I do think that in addition to trying to figure out how we provide access for, you know, tens of millions of people that we didn't really have to worry about a couple of months ago, it's going to be more important than ever that we get control of the cost of care because taxpayers are going to be picking that up directly. Uh, and so, I mean, I think it's a, it's a larger conversation, but it includes everything from uh, more rigorous antitrust enforcement uh, to really figuring out what to do about drug prices, even though they don't account for a major portion of spending. Uh, and and as, as Governor Kitzhaber said, very much moving away from the fee-for-service model and sort of doubling down on uh, some of the models that he talked about in terms of paying for quality, uh, you know, around the, the whole issue of payment reform. Thank you for outlining all of that. And then in particular, in this moment, rural hospitals are struggling. How did rural hospitals find themselves on the brink of collapse before this? And what might the impl implications of COVID-19 be for the practice of medicine in rural areas? Jerry, do you wanna take that one? Glad to. First of all, I totally agree with both governors. I actually went to Washington DC in 1978 to try to control healthcare costs. I'm glad they didn't give me tenure for being able to achieve my objective of controlling healthcare costs. I, I still have it. They don't take it away when you fail. <laughs> um, so Ariel, your question about rural hospitals, it was really important and really, it's not just rural hospitals, but rural communities. Recently, I was talking to the secretary in Mississippi for health about the rural hospitals. I'm really shocked to learn that most of the rural hospitals in Mississippi were built with Hilburton funds. And most of that occurred during the 1960s and 70s. And they've basically not done much renovation since. Few of them have ventilators. If you develop COVID-19 in rural Mississippi, your chance of getting adequate medical care is basically non-existent. Been working in other states as well. We've obviously seen rural outbreaks in lots of rural communities around meat packing plants, farm workers, mines, other places where people need to congregate. And most of the hospitals in that community are 50 beds or less. 
They have limited capacity to deal with this particular issue. Now, this isn't a big new issue. Rural hospitals have been closing in many parts of the country recently. Recently talked to a state senator from Wyoming. Uh, hospitals in Wyoming are basically 60 miles apart in most places. And when the hospital closes, it now becomes 60, 70 or 100 miles between one hospital and another. We have a, hot, a paper coming out in a journal called Health Affairs next month on the financial <laughs> status of rural hospitals. Essentially, um, their profit margins are about half what urban hospitals are. The lower the occupancy rate, the lower the profit margin. Many of these hospitals are operating at only 40% occupancy. And if they get a huge influx of patients, they just can't handle it. Um, if the state didn't expand Medicaid, which a number of states in the South didn't do, the profit margin is less. So essentially what we're seeing with COVID-19 is something for rural hospitals that we've seen for years, basically they are in serious trouble. And although the Congress has put in about $10 billion into them to deal with COVID-19, if, if it happens that COVID-19 really starts hitting the rural communities, they're gonna be seriously uh, in trouble. Thank you for outlining that. Um, healthcare costs have plagued federal, state, and employer budgets for years. And this idea of paying for value over volume is not new, but the devil is in the details, as we all know. How would you define value, Governor Kitzhopper? I think that's a really good question. You know, we've been focused almost exclusively on coverage without really asking what we're buying. Uh, and I believe that the key to the, the, the solution is shifting the focus away from coverage, as important as that is, to value and directly confronting the total cost of care. So let's talk about the difference between coverage and value, at least in my view. Coverage, I think we all recognize, means having the ability to pay for your health care when you need it without incurring economic hardship, without crypto crippling co-payments and deductibles, without having to choose between drugs and rent, uh, without having to worry about surprise billings. Uh, coverage has been the focus of the national debate for 25, 30 years. It's also the focus of most collective bargaining agreements. Who pays the bill, the employer or the employer? And unfortunately for a lot of employees, value is the part that don't pay for, which really begs the uh, value of what they're buying. Um, value is something entirely different to me. Value means that while we should all have coverage, that the, the, the care we get and the system through which we get it should produce value in terms of health outcomes. Uh, we shouldn't be paying for overtreatment or inflated prices or care that's inefficient and inequitable uh, or unnecessary. But most of all, I think value is a recognition that by far the things that have the greatest impact on our lifetime health status and the health of communities have little to do with their medical system and everything to do with the conditions of injustice that underlie disease, poverty, uh, hunger, unemployment, the disintegration of communities, uh, the, lack, the, la the lack of hope. Uh, and I think that um, addressing, it, it, that the, the value means addressing the total cost of care, getting that right up front on the table to make room in the budget so that we can actually invest in healthy pregnancies and nutrition and housing and stable families and safe communities and employment and education. Those investments, which to me form the threads from which the fabric of social justice is woven. And I was reading an article uh, this morning that at least 200 hospitals have furloughed workers since mid-March. Despite healthcare being recession-proof during the Great Recession in 2009 and steady growth since then, healthcare spending declined 18% in the first three months of this year in the middle of a public health crisis. What does that say about our healthcare system overall as we think about transforming it? Jerry, do you want to take that one? Thank you. Um, I totally agree with Dr. Kutzheber. We essentially in public health have been saying this for years about the socioeconomic determinants of health and how important they are. Most of the evidence suggests that they're responsible for more than 70% of healthcare spending in the United States. And if we did something about that, it's just keeping that money away from acute care. So hospitals were told to cut back on elective surgery and many did. Um, so that they could have space for COVID-19 patients. The problem that we're seeing right now is that many of these hospitals have very few or not for uh, uh, very few COVID patients. So if I look at the data from Johns Hopkins, most of the rural, ho the hospitals in the suburban areas 
have only about 20 to 40 COVID patients, but they have about 300 beds. So there's lots of empty space in some of the Johns Hopkins hospitals. So there is a need. At the same time, there's also a lot of money going to inappropriate places. So for example, my wife is a clinical social worker working in Bethesda, Maryland. She just got a stimulus check for $3,000. Aside from doing a little bit of telehealth work instead of going to her office, it's not really much different for her, yet she was fortunate enough to get the $3,000 check. I've had the opportunity recently to work with Congress on what they uh, should do about the $175 billion and who should get the money. Um, and the, really the question that we don't know is which of these hospitals actually need the money. They're all pleading poverty, but we, have, we don't really have very good data. Now we're starting to get a little bit. Um, we looked at the for-profit hospitals who are required by uh, the SEC to report data on them. And essentially what we're seeing in the month of April is that the for-profits had about a 50% reduction in their admissions, emergency rooms, and elective surgeries. Not 100%, but a significant reduction in April. It didn't start until the middle of March. We're starting now to work with the Ways and Means Committee to try to get the GAO to survey hospitals. The Office of Inspector General did this in the end of March, um, did a very good job. President Trump then fired her. Um, I think that that underscores just the, the enormity of the, the situation that we find ourselves in today. Um, COVID-19 has really just laid bare the disparities in our healthcare system. Governor Markell, can you outline how the structure of our healthcare system leaves so many Americans under, underserved? Yeah. So first of all, I, mean, I would say this is by far the most complicated public policy challenge that we face because changing it means talking about changing how an entire industry of people gets paid. And when we think, and you know, Governor Kitzhopper and Dr. Anderson both talked about value as we should. And you know, the bottom line is we spend about twice as much as other countries and our outcomes are worse. And that's sort of the, that is very much a reflection, of not getting value. But when you're talking about, for example, if we go from about 18% of GDP to what other, other countries are spending on healthcare, which is about 10% of GDP. You're talking about taking billions of dollars out of people's pockets. And that is what makes it so incredibly complicated. You know, one of the things that Obamacare did not get credit for is that it did have possibilities for moving away, for, for payment reform built in. Uh, to the law. And so we took advantage of this in Delaware. We actually got a $35 million grant to work with private uh, practices uh, to try to move them toward a uh, payment based on value rather than uh, fee for service. And at the, the bottom line is when there is no other industry which looks anything like healthcare, when you combine fee for service where people are getting paid to do procedures, whether or not they do any good, plus third party pay where none of us feel any of the pain in our own pockets for the most part when we uh, access these services. I mean, for most of us, if a doctor tells us to get an MRI or a CAT scan, we're gonna get it and we're gonna have no idea what it costs. There's no other industry like that. And so, you know, there are so many things sta standing in the way of reform. Uh, in, men most of our, in many of our communities, hospitals are the biggest employers. It's difficult to oftentimes to challenge uh, physicians on what they're getting paid. The pharmaceutical companies represent lots of good jobs in, in congressional districts around the uh, country. It's really hard to understand the web of interested parties and the flow of money. Uh, and while people generally understand how free markets work, in this case they don't because we don't. It does, we just don't have a real free market when it comes to uh, healthcare spending. So. We are being forced to confront this in a very new and very real way as a result of COVID and so many people, millions and tens of millions of people potentially being thrown off of their employer-based care. And so how we respond at this moment is going to be really, really important. And I think as Governor Kitzhaber said at the beginning, it does pre pre 
present perhaps a once in a lifetime opportunity to make big changes. The question is whether or not the political will will be there. And then I have two follow-up questions with that based on what you were just saying. But the first is, you know, we're in the middle of this health crisis, which has led to an economic crisis, which means that states are seeing less revenue and governors in three states, Ohio, Colorado, and Georgia have proposed cutting Medicaid program funding when we know people are moving from employer-sponsored coverage toward Medicaid. Um, what are the implications of these cuts? Yeah, there's all, I mean, from my perspective, uh, the, the only way out here is that the federal government is going to have to help the states. I mean, it's just, I mean, I, we, I, I was in office, and I think Governor Kitzhopper was in 2009-10 uh, as well. And um, I mean, that was, a, that was an unbelievably difficult time. And, uh, you know, we got, a, in, the, in the state of Delaware, got a couple hundred million dollars from the federal government, which was really helpful. It's, it's worse this time. And it just, I mean, I don't think people understand the implications. I mean, not just to Medicaid. I mean, you can't, can't cut much Medicaid much lower. I mean, there's so many practices that refuse to accept it now. Um, but just beyond that, we, the, the idea that there's a big debate about whether or not the states and local governments need help at this point is just sort of crazy. Yeah, I would say that uh, <clears throat> I was in office in 2011 during the depths of the Great Recession. You know, I think the result of these cuts will be to dramatically compromise access for millions of people. Many of them will not receive treatment for, for medical conditions. Some will die, for sure. Uh, but I think there's a third way. And in 2011, we had a huge budget deficit, as everyone else did. We had high unemployment, and about 40% of the budget deficit was in the Medicaid program. So it became clear if we did business as usual, we were going to have to cut provider rates by about 40% or drop tens of thousands of people from coverage. And we decided that we were going to look for a third path and look at the delivery system and see what would it take to get more value for each dollar we spent in terms of health outcomes. So the result was something called a coordinated care organization. It's a, it's a community-based organization with local providers, a local governance structure. We have 15 across the state. They care for one-fourth of our population now. They operate within a global budget that can only grow at 3.4% per year, per member per year. They have had to maintain enrollment. They had to maintain benefits. Uh, and they have to meet rigorous metrics around quality and outcome. So basically, we cap the total cost of care and force the delivery system to actually modify itself. And in the first five years between 2011 and 2012 and 2017, we operated within that growth cap. Uh, all the CCOs met the quality and outcome metrics. We added 385,000 more people under the ACA expansion. And we had a net all funds uh, 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 savings of about $1.1 billion after paying back the fe an, an initial federal investment. So the point is that it is possible to to expand coverage and reduce the rate of medical inflation without sacrificing quality, but you have to shift the debate and put the focus and the responsibility on the delivery system. Now, I just want to add to something that, uh, that Governor Markell said. You know, there's no way that you can suddenly take billions of dollars out of the delivery system without creating a whole different set of economic dislocation because of the massive employment. So I think what we did in Oregon was instructive. We got this initial $1.9 billion five-year investment but it wasn't a prop up the old Medicaid program. It was to transform it to something else. And we had a five-year glide path, right? In, during which time the federal investment went down as the savings went up. So I think to change the system, we have to agree on the destination. If we could agree, we're gonna have a, a risk-based contracts where providers assume total uh, accountability for total cost of care. And there's a new risk sharing agreement between payers and providers, that, that's where we're going. Then the question is not where we're going, but how we get there. And that changes the nature of the politics. And I'll give you one more example. If you're a hospital CEO today, you're gonna to ask how many people should I lay off? But what if the question was, how do I retrain the in-hospital folks to do something in the community? How do we repurpose excess beds? And how does the payment system have to deliver to make that happen? So uh, Thomas Pinchon in the book, Gravity of the Rainbow once said, you know, um, <clears throat> Uh, if you get them to ask the wrong questions, you don't have to worry about the answers. We need to start asking the right questions. And the first question is where we want to be five years from now, and then how do we get there together? And then I think, you know, you were talking about, you know, providers laying off people, given the fact that they're seeing less elective care. Um, one group of healthcare providers that doesn't seem to be hurting as much during this crisis are the hospitals and healthcare providers in Maryland who operate under a global budget. 
Jerry, can you explain how Maryland's model is helping during this pandemic and where there still might be some weaknesses that we can look to build on? Sure. So in 1971, Maryland got a waiver uh, to set the prices for all insurers, including Medicare. Um, and every insurer in Maryland essentially pays exactly the same price. Um, and we hope and we think the data shows that this program has saved Maryland residents really billions of dollars over the last 50 years. Um, in the past, the system controlled the rate of increase in prices for hospital services. And now it's transformed to control the total rate of growth in hospital spending. It means that you essentially have to control volumes as well as price. So it's a global budget. We've been exporting it to Pennsylvania. We're talking to a number of other states about this type of model, mostly for rural hospitals. Um, what does it mean in the world of COVID-19? Well, we have fewer admissions, but the global budget means that the hospitals get paid the same amount, whether you have N patients or half N patients. And so essentially hospitals in Maryland actually turn out to be better off than other hospitals. We've had this system for a long time and the, the value of the hospitals is good. Hopkins has always done very well in terms of the national ratings. The financial uh, stability of the hospitals is very good. Um, and so I think, you know, ironically, COVID-19 will actually be very good for Maryland hospitals. And it's something that Dr. Kutzaber and Mark Hell have been talking about in terms of changing from fee for service to, to value. And Maryland has been doing this for a long period of time. And I think, you know, everyone on this call is in agreement that some form of capitated budget will be necessary to reform how we deliver and pay for care in the US. Um, how do we think about setting that up? Like you can think about it for rural hospitals or Maryland hospitals, but how do you sort of scale it to a federal model? And I'm leaving this one open-ended, so whoever wants to jump in and, and tackle that question. Well, I would say that I, 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 uh, I, I'm not really optimistic about the United States Congress suddenly stepping forward and, you know, I mean, the, the debate we're having about whether states need help is that uh, Jack mentioned is just emblematic of, of the problem back there. But I think that I think that I think the I think this is going to come at the state level, uh, state innovation that's then scaled on a regional level. I mean, I think, for example, in Oregon, in Washington, in the West Coast, we have something called the Pacific Coast Collaborative, which is a, actually it's for economic development, and environmental issues, but it's a pact between Oregon, Washington, and California, and actually British Columbia that aligns our interests uh, on 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 environmental and economic issues. I would see taking different models and trying to scale those like along the Pacific Coast in the Northeast. Uh, and 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 begin to move in that direction because I think that the system is going to be looking for models. I, I really believe that. I do believe we're not going. There's no way we're going to go back to what we were doing before. And the elements of the system that get that, that figure that out, and get ahead of the curve are the ones that are going to thrive. And so I think our responsibility as 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 state officials is to provide those robust examples of what can work and engage them in a discussion of how to design the system that's going to get us where we agree we want to go or where we're going to get to whether we want it or not. Uh, and I think that then will, will, and the role of the federal government would be to provide flexibility and support for those kinds of, those kinds of models. And I think that's how you begin to move the, the system forward. So I would just add, I mean, there, there are some interesting models uh, in other countries, but you know, the, the problem is that when we try to talk about those models in this country, it immediately gets caught up in political rhetoric and the, uh, the opponents will call it, well, it's socialized medicine, which frankly, it really isn't. I mean, we're, I'm talking about countries where the system is not owned by the, you know, the hospitals are not owned by the, the government, the practices are not owned by the government, but there's more uh, sort of regional negotiations and the like between uh, payers and providers. And uh, we just seem to have gotten to a point in this country where um, the political, the, the partisanship on this issue has just been incredibly difficult. And I know when I was the, uh, uh, when I was governor and, and, and as chair of NGA, the, gov the Republicans and Democrats could agree on a lot, but the one thing we could not agree on ever uh, was healthcare. And I do wonder whether this crisis may force yeah. uh, reconsideration of that kind of partisanship. Yeah, you know, I would just add to that, that, that 
the, the, the difference between a congressperson and a, and a governor is that we have to balance our budgets. I mean, this is incredibly real. And we don't have the luxury of pushing difficult political decisions into the national debt, which both Democrats and Republicans do, by the way. Right. And so, I mean, I do think that when you are on the ground at a state level and you've got your health care system imploding around you and your people without access to health care, you're under you're defunding education because you can't uh, uh, pay the health care bill. It's very, very real. And the politics, I think, uh, become less partisan and more about more solution solution oriented, which is, I think is a hopeful thing. So I've been doing a fair amount of international work um, and I have two systems that I particularly like in terms of how they negotiate price and those are Japan and Germany. And in Germany, essentially you have on one side of the table all the insurers and on the other side of the table you have all the providers and they come up with one rate. It's not like the United States where every insurer negotiates separately with every single um, provider um, they ha it's one collective system, and that just seems to work very much better. In Japan, they do an extra thing, and they say, well, when there's an increase in volume, is that due to increased illnesses, or did we just pay it wrong? And if we paying too much, we'll see more of that particular service being provided. So they go in and they make adjustments to the payment system when they see unnecessary, in their view, increases in volume. And then this is something we touched on earlier, but there are obviously huge disparities in healthcare that, and we're seeing this, you know, play out in COVID with the people who are, have higher risk factors um, are more likely to die. Um, and so, but a lot of these healthcare disparities stem from economic or social disparities. How do you, how do we think about addressing these so-called, you know, social determinants of health in the healthcare system? And then either Jerry, Kitzhaber, someone want to take a stab at that? So I think for me, the question is, should the healthcare system take the lead in this particular thing? They are sort of, in some ways, the natural one, and they have stepped up to the plate, but they're going to look at it from a healthcare perspective and is, does it save money for the healthcare system? So do I really want the hospital to be involved in early childhood education, make cleaning up the environment, doing all these things that are very important for socioeconomic determinants of health, reforming the welfare system. Hospitals are starting to look at this as, as an opportunity and their social determinants of health and their community benefits. But for me, I'm a little concerned that the hospital should not necessarily be the one taking the lead in trying to improve these socioeconomic determinants of health. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. Uh, Bobby Kennedy in his 68 campaign said something to the effect that it's illusory to think you can cure a sickly child if they don't have enough food to eat. That's 53 years ago. And, you know, we've known for decades, as you pointed out, that Met, the med, medical care has very little to do with uh, the overall health of communities and individuals. And then we've got the ACE study, which is, you know, the Adverse Childhood Experience Study, which is now a quarter of a century old that made this direct link between toxic stress in childhood and even pregnancy and a whole host of negative outcomes. And we're still mired uh, in this debate about helping more people get access to an inequitable system that doesn't produce health. And I do think there's three things necessary to, to, to turn that around. First of all, you have to have the money to make those investments long-term. And that's where reducing the total cost of medical comes in. To me, that's the big role of the healthcare system is to free up resources to make those community investments. Secondly, you need to know where to spend them. And the fact is we can identify at-risk children and families right down to neighborhoods, zip codes, and sometimes households. And we also know of the interventions. So the question is how do you, and then the third issue is you need a delivery system it gets the right services to the right children and families at the right time in the right amount for long enough to do the job. And I would agree that it is not the responsibility, I think, of hospitals or the health system. They're not social service agencies. They're not housing authorities. They're not school districts. Those aren't, those aren't their core competencies. But if you create an integrated model, and I'm just going to go back to the CCOs, which basically have a mandate to move beyond the narrow clinical model and look more broadly at community health, they can be a convener they can be a place where you begin to knit all these things together because as you pointed out, the hospital is a central institution in most communities. Uh, and I think there's a way to get there. But if we don't bend down the total cost of care and begin talking less about coverage and more about what we're buying, 
and what we're not buying because of the opportunity cost, there's just no way to get from here to there. And I don't believe we can't do this. I, I, I think we can, and I think we will. You know, I think one of the things that we need to continue to do a better job on is, is proving out the return on investment. Some of these kinds of social determinants of health investments. I read a great book probably 20 years ago called Working the Working Poor by David Shipler. And he's got this great passage in there. He talks about a single mother who's raising a 10-year-old kid in, a, in an apartment that uh, has mold. And, uh, you know, the boy's asthma leads to an uh, ambulance run to the hospital. And the ambulance run leads to a bill that, you know, the mother is unable to pay. And the unpaid bill leads to a bad credit report. And a bad credit report leads to a higher interest rate on a car, which means she can't afford a decent car, which means it's less likely that she's going to be able to show up to a job on time, which means she's stuck in a job that doesn't pay very well, which leads to an apartment with mold. And it's really, I mean, I think it, it, it sort of brings the whole thing full circle, but it really, I mean, I'm so glad you asked the question because there's so much more to the, to the question than sort of care models. Um, and, you know, while you're talking about uh, sort of disparities, the other disparity that I think just deserves mentioning is with the, the fee-for-service model, what that really leads to is to too little treatment for some patients and to too much treatment for others, which is crazy. And uh, it doesn't get nearly enough attention, but people will act the way their incentives tell them to act. And if you're, you know, if you're getting paid better to do a procedure, you're going to get, you know, you're going to do it more often. And if you're getting paid less, you're going to do it less often. And regardless, and, and, and that's sort of regardless of what the health outcome is. So I think, you know, there are a couple of different ways of looking at the, the, this issue of the disparities. And so my next question is a little dark, but I think it's sort of, I'm trying to get to sort of the political challenges of moving the needle on these issues. Um, but if we imagine the world in January, 2021, um, the economy could be sputtering, a vaccine may or may not be available, um, and the US is sort of losing its position as a global leader. How does a new administration come in and prioritize healthcare reform in the middle of all of these other uh, important issues. Well, Anyone I would, can take a step. I mean, I think I think the problem is we don't. It's it's not healthcare reform we need. We need to figure out how to keep our people healthy and well employed, and productive, with some sense of satisfaction and purpose in their lives. And and as long as we we view this in in such a silo, this is just about the healthcare system. Well, it isn't about the healthcare system. Uh, as we've been, we've heard in many countries around many countries around the world, they've they figured this out, right? So I think we, I think the best thing the new president could do would, would be to change the frame of the debate, and certainly health, you know, and, and say what is it we want? What is it we want as a as as a society? What are the aspirations we want for our children? What are our shared values? And then how do we get there? And you're going to run right into healthcare as a major obstacle. But you put it into a larger context. It's keeping us from getting where we want to be. As, as Americans. And so I think that reframing and providing an, in, an inspirational context for the healthcare debate would be very, very useful and refreshing. I, I, I think that's right. But I also think that there's going to be some transition period uh, where we have got to deal with the fact that tens of millions of people who were just a few months ago had health coverage through employer employers no longer will. <clears throat> and so I know I think Vice President Biden put out a proposal uh, recently that said for a lot of those people, the federal government would would step in and pay their COBRA, uh, you know, uh, payments. I think that's one, you know, very interesting idea. But I mean, we just, I mean, when you think about all the folks who are going to be moving from employer-based care to either exchanges, to Medicaid, to uninsured care, the taxpayers are going to have a much, uh, a much we already had, the taxpayers already have a massive role because of Medicare and Medicaid. And, and the exchanges. And it's only going to get bigger, which is why I think there's got to be more and more focus, not just on access, but on, but on, on, on the cost piece. And th I mean, this, this, and by the way, this could be an entire, you know, webinar uh, of its own, but between the, you know, in, in so many places, the, the negotiations between uh, payers and providers can be incredibly one-sided. Uh, and there are a bunch of examples of that. That's one thing when you think about, I mean, I, I just think the, the idea that the federal government, which is such a big purchaser of uh, pharmaceuticals, you know, is unable to negotiate 
uh, prices. Medicare cannot negotiate uh, pharmaceutical prices. It's ridiculous. And I'm sure there are probably some folks on the call from the pharmaceutical industry who may disagree with that. But I mean, I, I think that's crazy. And then, you know, one of the, I can't remember the name of it, one of the organizations set up on the ACA to sort of study the efficacy of healthcare uh, is not allowed to consider the cost. Right. Picori is that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Picori. And uh, in other countries, I think, I think in Australia, doctors are required to have a conversation with their patients about what the cost of care uh, is going to be. And even now, I was just reading yesterday um, uh, that, uh, you know, I think Lamar Alexander is stepping down is trying to get a, a bill through before he finishes um, around surprise billing. And, uh, and he's, it's a bipartisan uh, bill. Um, boy, the idea that we can't get behind a, a, a law that sort of get, prohibits surprise billing. So if you go to a hospital and your hospital's in network, but you're seen by a bunch of doctors who are not in network and you have no idea what that bill is going to show I me. Mean, it's just, this is crazy. This is craziness. And the taxpayers have a total incentive uh, to be driving the terms of this debate because we are the ones paying for it and we will, and we'll be paying more and more as a result of COVID. Well, and the thing that you said taxpayers, you know, pay for Medicaid and Medicare and, you know, exchange of subsidies, but because of the employer exclusion, they're also paying for employer sponsored care by the fact that that's not taxable revenue. Exactly. So at the end of the day, right. every single person is getting subsidized care by the taxpayers, except for people who make above 400% of the federal poverty level yeah. and go to the exchanges and the uninsured. Everyone else is getting subsidized care. Okay. Um, uh, but, uh, oh, Jerry, yeah, try. So Governor Markell talked about the whole issue of out of network, which I think we didn't really talk about and is absolutely critical. And let me just tell you a very quick story. So. I got my routine colonoscopy done at Johns Hopkins a year ago, and I knew that Hopkins was in network, the hospital. I knew that the person performing the colonoscopy was in network, but I had no idea who my anesthesiologist was going to be. And they don't decide at Hopkins until the morning of the procedure who is going to be the anesthesiologist. And that's not the best time to negotiate price when you've done all your prep and everything else has happened, and you know you're going on the on the uh, on in the in the hospital and you're trying to negotiate price. It turned out she was part of the Hopkins network and was in network. The other thing that I don't think we mentioned very much so far is the whole issue of public option. Um, it was something that was discussed a lot in Obamacare. It almost got in. It's one of those things that's starting to, to come back up again. We know that Washington State has got a public option. Colorado almost had a public option. There's a number of states that are looking at the whole issue of public option that allows the, the, the people to buy into a Medicare type of system or based upon Medicare rates, which would bring down the prices. So there's a number of very interesting things that are going on in the states around public option that I think we should take a look at. And then that sort of leads to my next question, which is just that healthcare has become so politicized. Even just last week, there was another ACA case in front of the Supreme Court and the president was talking about getting rid of the ACA. Um, we are all in agreement that these are vital issues that we need to make progress on, but how do we bring Republicans along? Well, <clears throat> at the risk of angering my party, it's not just Republicans we have to bring along because if yeah. the Democrats insist on just expanding coverage with the cost be damned, we're actually undermining a lot of other things that Democrats believe in, like investing in children and families and housing, right? So I, I think it's a broader question than the Republicans. And I'll just uh, follow up on something that, that Jack said, that Governor Markell said, you know, we're going to own this system at the end of this COVID uh, crisis, I, I think it's going to take at least another $3 trillion, two to $3 trillion this year to keep people and businesses afloat. And, and at that point, uh, we'll have a national debt approaching $28 trillion and our debt to GDP ratio is going to be off the scale. So we're going to be facing, I think, potential systemic bankruptcy unless we can begin to get the debt down. And there's nothing that gets people attention, more attention than a default. Uh, which in, in, you know, impacts everybody, it impacts the drug companies, it impacts industry, it impacts individuals. 
So I do think that, 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 that there's going to be an opportunity there to come together around the, around the cost issue that wasn't there before. And as Governor Malcarroll said, we're in the driver's seat. We should be negotiating uh, prices. And I don't mean just drug prices. I mean ambulatory surgery, lab, x-ray, everything that's, that's you know, trying to maximize profit <clears throat> right now. And it's not a radical idea. It's what every large employer does. It's simply saying we are going to get the best value and the best price for our constituents, which are the taxpayers of the United States of America. So I think the looming fiscal crisis is what's going to create the environment in which the D's and R's get over the partisan gridlock. And then um, sometimes healthcare policy can feel like Groundhog Day and that we have the same debates over and over, but we only seem to make progress in the margins. All of you sort of brought up an example throughout this conversation, but kind of I think for closing thoughts, can each of you highlight a recent change at the federal or state level that you think has potential to improve care delivery or reduce costs or something that we could be looking to um, as we try and make progress? So for me, the biggest change of the last 15 years is the focus on people with chronic and multiple chronic conditions. Back in the 1990s, when I started working on it, we obviously knew that people had diabetes and congestive heart failure and other things, but we never put it together that many of these people had diabetes and congestive heart failure. So when I looked at the Medicare data, we saw that two thirds of the Medicare spending was by people with five or more chronic conditions. And once we sort of recognize that in the Medicare program, and it's not quite as true in Medicaid and in the, in the private sector, but it's still pretty much concentrated on people with chronic conditions, we essentially see that the system wasn't oriented to them. We didn't do care coordination. We didn't do a whole variety of things. And Dr. Kitzheiber talked about the programs in Oregon, which are the, the programs that are changing the healthcare system. And if you look at COVID-19, what we see is who's dying from COVID-19. It's people with multiple chronic conditions. 80% of the people dying have, have multiple chronic conditions. So we're getting a system around people with multiple chronic conditions. So for me, that's one of the big highlights for the past 15 years. Governor uh, Markell or Governor yeah, Gitzelberg? Go ahead. Go ahead, Governor Markell. Um, I think some of the steps toward um, uh, accountable care organizations that uh, Governor Kitzhaber mentioned have been important. I think uh, uh, some of the steps that a lot of states now are doing met, uh, managed, uh, med, you know, Medicaid with managed care. I think these are important moves. I think we haven't moved as aggressively as we, uh, as we should. And frankly, I also, I mean, I'll acknowledge it's easier for me to talk about some of these things now that I'm not in office than when I was, because I, I mean, you know, I, I risked the wrath of some big constituents if I talked about things like Medicare negotiating drug prices or importation of uh, drugs or facilitating uh, generics. I mean, you know, these are kind of, these are the kinds of things I probably, I should have said probably wouldn't have uh, when I was governor. And I think, you know, being out, I have more, you know, a lot of us have, have more freedom, but I just, I mean, I, I think some of those steps around we, we need to double down on the move toward payment reform, paying for value and away from fee for service. And it's a very difficult process. Again, I really do think it's the most compli complicated public policy challenge we face because it is talking about taking money out of people's pockets. But when you think about how much money the taxpayers can save and the estimates are in the hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars, uh, this, is a, this is really a, a conversation well worth having. I would say that the, the thing that's very hopeful to me is the fact that people are beginning to recognize <clears throat> the role of, of, of social investments in health. You know, I mean, we act as though social determinants is, the, is it, we just, we just realized it's here, right? And it's been around for decades, but it's becoming more mainstream. And I would just close by saying, um, you, you know, the, when, when you think about the greatest threats facing America today, I don't think it's the trade deficit. I don't think it's even COVID-19. I think it's the fact that 60% of our kids are exposed at a very early age to one or more risk factors that profoundly compromises their ability to succeed. And that's disproportionate among poor people and communities of color. And you can't protect our kids from those risk factors by building a wall, but only by building strong communities. And you can't, 
you can't address it. You can't give them that, that uh, effort to succeed, that opportunity to succeed by spending more on the healthcare systems. You got to spend more <clears throat> um, on, on strong children and families. So to me, that's very, very hopeful. It's a part of the debate now, not a, not a sideline, and we need to continue to push that forward. Great. Well, does anyone have any closing thoughts before we wrap things up? Stay safe. Yeah, stay safe. Thank you everyone so much for your time and your expertise. Um, we'll make this uh, available as a link and so that you can send it out to people and anyone on the call can do that as well. Um, please feel free to let us know if you have any questions. We have Governor Kitzhopper's paper on our website, which is on this topic. Um, and we have Governor Markell's op-ed, which he recently published in the hit hill on this topic. Uh, so please look to those and thank you again and everyone stay healthy and safe. Thanks, Ariel. Thank you. Thank you.